So good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome to the symposium arranged by uh, Concept Medical. We want to discuss with you uh, about uh, the potential of uh, Serolimus as a next generation drug to revolutionize uh, the treatment uh, in uh, the peripheral arterial space. Uh, so my great honor is first of all to uh, introduce the chairman and I would also directly hand over to Niels Kucher who is uh, with us uh, today. Um, we also have uh, Konstantinos Karzanos, uh, we have uh, Francesco Listro and we have uh, Dr. Tang uh, joining us. Uh, so Niels. Thank you Dirk for uh, letting me chair this session. I think it's a quite uh, uh, interesting field uh, and before I think we go to the first uh, live case introduction. Uh, let me just make one comment. Is, uh, Limos is, has uh, basically taken the coronary space completely. Uh, Pachytaxel is out there. So let's see uh, if we can create evidence in the future for uh, to find out if Limos works also in the peripheral arteries. And I think we should switch now first uh, to, to the first live uh, case transmission to Dr. Choke. Hi, hi, uh, to everyone from Singapore. Uh, my name is uh, Edward Chok, and with me, uh, operating with me is uh, Dr. Tay Chia Sheng and uh, Dr. Cheng Xin Chuan. Um, today, our case is a 71-year-old female, um, has got a multi-level, multi-vessel disease, uh, has got CLTI. Her CLTI is stage five, rather first. Uh, she has got a wound in her left foot, which is a charcoal foot, which is non-healing. Poorly controlled uh, diabetes mellitus. Previous STEMI about nine years ago. Hypertension, hyperlipidemia. And this is her foot. And she has previously undergone uh, two previous debridements by the orthopedic team uh, a month ago and just a few weeks ago. Uh, although the wound is clean, however, it's getting bigger with no signs of healing, no previous angioplasties to this la uh, lady's left leg. This is a duplex scan, which we always get prior to our angioplasties. The SFA, uh, diffuse stenosis, and a high-grade stenosis in the distal SFA. ATA, uh, so multiple diffuse disease in the uh, tibial vessels. Um, ATA, diffuse stenosis. And near the distal ATA, close to the ankle, is a near occlusion indicated by trickle of flow. There is a high-grade stenosis in the proximal uh, peroneal and also in the TP trunk. The toe pressures are 51 compared to 95 on, a, on the other leg. Um, this is quite interesting in that our, our lab has not identified the posterior tibial artery, so this may be a variant. And uh, the peroneal drains into the uh, distal or posterior tibial artery into the lateral plantar arteries. Um, so in terms of the strategy, um, we're going to put a five French uh, sheath. Uh, passage of SFA and the stenosis will be with the V18 wire, uh, guided by a four French Burr catheter. Passage of the distal arteries will be with a 018, uh, followed by a command uh, and a 2.6 French CXI support catheter. Um, in terms of the uh, angioplasty, uh, plan to uh, vessel prep with a five millimeter Mustang balloon to the SFA, and then planning to um, serolimus coating balloon with a five millimeter magic touch uh, to the SFA once we vessel prep it, stenting with live stent if necessary. In terms of the distal arteries, we're gonna vessel prep with a non-compliant three millimeter Achilles balloon, followed by SCB with a three millimeter magic touch serolimus coated balloon, perhaps stenting with the uh, 3.5 to 4 millimeter abluminous serolimus coated stent if necessary. So uh, let's move on to the uh, pictures we have uh, started. So we have gone to the uh, vessel prep. Uh, this is an anti-grade approach, um, waiting for the pictures to come out, the angiogram pictures. So this is the angiogram. Uh, as you can see at the top in the proximal SFA, uh, quite a uh, 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 significant disease in the proximal, followed by reasonably uh, normal vessel at the, uh, at the mid SFA. That's the high grade stenosis in the mid SSA, SFA, uh, followed by several diffuse disease uh, at the bottom. 
And then near the 350 mark there, uh, I think there's also a tight uh, single stenosis in the 350 mark on the glow and tail ruler there. In terms of the distal run, uh, quite severe diffuse disease of the anterior tibial artery, uh, tippy trunk, and also in the proximal peroneal, as uh, we saw on the duplex scan, very little in the posterior tibial artery. Distal to that, uh, you can see now the near uh, occlusion of the uh, 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 anterior tibial artery. Uh, there's some overlap with the peroneal, so we did it on the lateral run, and it shows it a bit more clearly. if I can get it uh, moving. <clears throat> so this lateral run, uh, that's the peroneal coming down followed by the anterior tibial artery. And that's the near uh, occlusion of the distal anterior tibial artery. In the foot, um, there's a tight stenosis near the ankle. Uh, as you can see coming in now in the anterior tibial artery. And then the dorsalis plantar looked pretty okay. Uh, there's some uh, 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 plantar arch. Okay. So what we've done, um, we've tackled the anterior tibial artery first. So this is the CXI catheter managed to cross uh, into the anterior tibial artery. And um, actually all of it was done anti-grade. This is with uh, uh, overlay and this is the command uh, ESY coming down some uh, uh, degree of uh, uh, resistance in the um, uh, uh, very tight stenosis at the distal ATA. But in the end, I think uh, we went through, it was pretty okay, yeah. Okay, that's why I said crossing. Uh, did a run at the bottom of the foot and this is with the CXI catheter near the ankle. So this is where we're at, and uh, we've gone on to uh, angioplasty, the anterior tibial artery, the peroneal artery, the SFA. Uh, with uh, for the bottom, we did we used the uh, Achilles uh, three millimeter non-compliant balloon to vessel prep, and for the SFA, we used the uh, five millimeter Mustang balloon. So I'm going to show you the results of the uh, after the uh, proba. This is with a five millimeter Mustang at the proximal SFA. Sorry, we're just trying to find the. Um And that's the, the across the high-grade stenosis, um, reasonable results across that. And this is after angioplasting the uh, anterior tibial artery. We hadn't done the peroneal yet. Distally. There was still a bit of a recall there, so we repeated the angioplasty to the anterior tibial artery. And this is the result after repeating the angioplasty. So quite nice flow now through the anterior tibial artery. And into the foot, this is the result into the foot. And following this, we angioplasty the peroneal. And these are the final results after vessel prepping the peroneal and the anterior tibial artery. This is the foot run. So this is where we're at. Now the uh, perforation flow is now down the anterior tibial artery rather than the peroneal artery, and the peroneal artery through the posterior calcaneal branches supplying to the distal posterior tibial artery into the lateral and the middle plantar arteries. 
So what do you think, guys? Um, at this stage, uh, what would be your, you know, what, what do you think? I think uh, it's uh, beautiful so far. Um, I mean, uh, this is a multi, uh, multi uh, upper leg and lower leg disease, and you have basically prepped the, the vessel. Uh, some people probably probably would stop now and say, well, the patient will benefit already from plain angioplasty, but I guess you're going to plan to treat uh, with the Olimus, uh coated balloons and uh, my question to you is before we start with the first talk now um, is uh, would you treat the lower upper and lower leg both with uh, Zirolimus coated balloons or are you do you think the culprit vessel is the anterior tibia and you just treat that one yeah um, personally I would want to choose one artery down to the foot in order to let us heal the wound so my, my feeling is that I need at least one uh, uh, inline flow, and I would choose that artery to be the anterior tibial artery. Uh, I would want this artery to be open for at least uh, six months to give us that much of a time to, uh, to get the wound to heal. So yes, I would put in a serolimus coated balloon starting from the ankle, treat the entire anterior tibial artery, and I would also treat the lesions in the uh, SFA as well. That would be my okay. uh, personal approach. So I think because we are coming back, uh, you let us know when you have done the case and uh, we, we, we will switch back to you and see the final angiograms after uh, uh, additional angioplasty. And uh, we will probably start uh, with the first presentation by Konstantinos uh, Katsanos and, and he will speak about uh, overcoming Paclitaxel with Sirolimus and PAD. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. I will be discussing about some key differences between Paclitaxel and Sirolimus in peripheral vascular disease. Those are my conflicts of interest. Uh, now, Paclitaxel versus Sirolimus, so much to be said about uh, first, uh, very different mode of action. Paclitaxel is an antimitoxic agent that blocks cell proliferation by binding to the intracellular tubulin, and it blocks the cell cycle at the M phase. In the contrary, Seroimus is a cytostatic agent, an immunosuppressor, and it binds to the intracellular receptor FKPB12. It blocks the uh, activity of the MT or uh, mTOR, and it blocks the cell cycle with the G1 phase, so cytotoxic versus cytostatic. Uh, now, uh, this is the most uh, important slide of my talk, I guess. Uh, very, very important and very, very uh, uh, key differences uh, between the two agents in terms of chemistry and inhibition of smooth muscle cells and uh, endothelial cell uh, as well. For example, uh, the IC50, looking at the endothelial cell uh, uh, arrest, uh, several orders of magnitude difference, one picomola in case of paclitaxel compared to one nanomola in case of serolimus. In addition, the therapeutic range is very, very narrow in case of Paclitaxel and very wide in case of Seroimus. And there are differences also in the way the two uh, medications partition across the vessel wall uh, layer. Um, the diffusion and the tissue binding capacity is also very, very different. For example, uh, Paclitaxel tends uh, to diffuse more in the planar uh, axis uh, and less in the transmural axis uh, the, compared to rapamycin. Rapamycin, I mean, Seroimus. And uh, if you have a look on the right hand side, you can see also that Paclitaxel tends to accumulate more in the adventitial uh, vessel wall layer compared to rapamycin uh, that seems uh, to diffuse to partition even we across all three vessel wall layers. Now, as I said previously, uh, the therapeutic range is the most important aspect. Seroimus has a very wide therapeutic range. You can see a very wide range from a no effect at one uh, nanogram per milligram tissue up to a toxic effect more than uh, 10K nanogram per milligram uh, uh, tissue concentration. Right-hand side, on the contrary, Paclitaxel, uh, several orders in our uh, uh, therapeutic range, range from, from one up to 100 nanograms per milligram gram tissue. So we have to we have to fine-tune the uh, uh, the tissue concentration very very tightly. 
Uh, there is also so much discussion about uh, the risk-benefit analysis. This is what we published back in 2018. Our meta-analysis in the femoropopletial segment, where we showed 62% higher risk of death out to five years at the top with the use of paclitaxel code device in the femoropopletial axis. Uh, the benefit at the bottom, uh, minus 42% risk reduction of target vision revascularization, again, in the same uh, patient population. 2020, uh, we published the risk benefit analysis with paclitaxel at one year for the infrapopletial arteries, 52% higher risk of death or major amputation out to one year with the use of paclitaxel coated by wounds alone in the infrapopletial vessels. On the contrary, 47% lower risk of target vision vascularization. So there is effect, but there is also certainly some risk to be discussed with the patient. What about paclitaxel destabilization when we are applying paclitaxel coated balloons? It seems to be a universal, uh, a, a universal characteristic of current uh, order and current generation of drug coated uh, balloons. There is also the finding with a numerical trend with uh, more major amputations in the impact deep study with the use of paclitaxel coated balloons in the Bironi arteries, and we also have animal data with a, a dose uh, a response, a dose uh, a relevant. Uh, Accumulation of uh, paclitaxel in the skin of uh, the uh, hindrims of the of the animals when paclitaxel coated balloons were applied in an experimental setting. Here in vascular response, again, a lot of differences. Um, Serolimus uh, seems uh, to have uh, to produce lower inflammation scores compared to paclitaxel. I will point out here that those are uh, uh, data originating from studies in the coronary space uh, from paclitaxel and uh, serolimus eroding stents, and those are not uh, coated balloon devices. Uh, we have also some similar findings with use of paclitaxel coated stents in the uh, femoropopletial axis. It has been noted that, that uh, paclitaxel seems uh, to induce significantly higher vessel wall inflammation. Uh, this is a, a cross section on the short axis. Uh, you can see this hypochoic uh, halo uh, around the stand uh, with, uh, that points to vessel wall edema, uh, uh, confirmed also with contrast enhanced uh, uh, magnetic resonance angiography. Uh, and you can see the high uptake of the gadolinium uh, around the stand in the femoropopletial vessel. Now, uh, the, as, we, as we move on to discuss more about head-to-head -head differences in terms of effect uh, uh, and uh, perhaps effectiveness in real-world studies, uh, uh, this is uh, some key findings from head-to-head uh, -head comparisons in the coronary space. Again, when, we, when uh, randomized studies compared drug uh, routing uh, serolimus and paclitaxel stents, uh, you can see uh, that across all cases, uh, five uh, different studies here, a serolimus routing stent uh, was more effective in reducing target vision vascularization in the y-axis and rate women loss on the south on the x-axis. The same as shown here, where serolimus has been found to be superior to paclitaxel in head-to-head -head coronary randomized studies uh, across a wide range of increasing level of complexity of, uh, uh, of atherosclerosis. Uh, the y-axis here demonstrates instant, uh, the rate of instant stenosis, and you can see that across, uh, pretty much across the board, across all pairs of studies, uh, uh, serolimus uh, everything stand at the bottom was more effective than the paclitaxel stand. Uh, the, red uh, points at the top. Now, uh, we have some very, very early evidence in peripheral vascular disease as well with serolimus coated balloons. At the top, you can see the red woman was at six months, uh, the forest plot from three different randomized studies, uh, some uh, numerical reduction significant with the use of paclitaxel coated balloons. And from one study alone with the use of serolimus coated balloons, uh, red woman was uh, seems to drift more to the left hand side. So, even lower numerical uh, red woman was with the use of a serolimus coated balloon in the thermopropylial segment that is alone. So in conclusion, serolimus appears to have a more favorable pharmacologic profile than paclitaxel. It has been definitely shown to be uh, more effective in terms of reducing stenosis in the coronary space when studying drug eluting stents, and uh, uh, it may be a reasonable alternative in the lower limbs, especially in light of the recent paclitaxel safety uh, concerns. And with that, I'm going to thank you very, very much for your attention. So thank you very much, uh, Konstantinos, for this uh, very good introduction about uh, the mechanism of disease, uh, the uh, efficacy of, of uh, both drugs, um, uh, or basic science perspective. 
and also um, giving us some old uh, historical feedback from the coronary field. And what I hear is that we should move back to the live case before we go to the next presentation. Is that correct? So, uh, Dr. Chok, how far are you? Uh, yes, so we are applying our second Cirolimus uh, uh, coated balloon. Um, so this is the three millimeter by 80. We've already applied a three by 200 in the distal atrial tibial artery. So this is just finished uh, uh, two minutes, uh, 12 atmospheres. So we're going to bring the balloon down. And we're going to show you the uh, run uh, following the application of this SCB to the distal uh, vessels. Um, <clears throat> So while you're doing the angiogram, uh, Dr. Chok, uh, you probably have used uh, this kind of balloon many times. Uh, have you ever had a case of distal embolization? Uh, no, I haven't seen any. Um, no distal embolization and uh, no, no, no flaking and no, uh, no, no slow flow phenomenon. None that I've seen. Um, uh, have uh, you in a minute, had, uh, perhaps uh, also before we uh, put the balloon in, I can show you what the balloon looks like. Uh, on the outside, uh, in terms of what we mean by uh, no flicking of the uh, of the residues, um, yeah. So this is the run now. Uh, uh, hopefully, this will be my first <laughs> this lambalization. Yeah. Okay. So this is the run in a proximal. And distally, let's have a look. Okay, and down to the foot. So the peroneal still okay. I've not drugged the peroneal. Okay, open up side to side, please. It's interesting to see the recoil uh, distally, right, in the anterior tibial. Hmm. Yeah. Generally, uh, recoil rate is uh, high. So I've gone on to use a uh, more non-compliant eye because I personally I see less uh, recoil uh, with uh, non-compliant balloons for distal arteries. Yeah, but, but you're right, there's a lot of recoil in uh, artery. So we use uh, GTN quite a bit to try and uh, also combat some of the recoil. So this is a result uh, in the distal. So we're going to apply now the uh, SCB to the uh, uh, high-grade stenosis in the uh, uh, mid-SFA. around the. Uh, so we use a 5 by um, 80 Mustang here. So we're going to use a 5 by 100 Magic Touch uh, PTA balloon. Yeah. See so if you can change the camera to here. Perhaps uh, we can show you what the uh, balloon is like. Yeah, can you see it? Okay. Hi, Eddie. It's June. Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi, June. How are you? How are you? Listen, uh, why don't you give it a shake to see whether it actually does flake, to show the, or, to show the audience okay. it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't flake at all. all right, okay. Give it a good shake. So, so, so the way we use this is we actually remove the sheath, and this is what it looks like. Um, see so if I were to give it a shake or a shake. Uh, okay, there you are. And also Nothing comes a, off. A, a little flick. little flick, yeah. So this is what it looks like. Um, okay, so um, we're going to uh, apply it now to the um, to the um, uh, uh, SFA. What's your sizing principle using this balloon with uh, with your artery or with your pobar um, balloon? I, I generally um, do a one to one, but then I go to RBP with the Magic Touch uh, Cirolimus coated balloon. So with the um, non-compliant uh, balloon, I will use the same size but I would go to probably nominal pressure or just above nominal pressure. And then with the serolimus coated balloon, I'll, use to, uh, I'll go to um, uh, right, rate of burst pressure. So it's slightly more than the uh, diameter indicated in the balloon itself, yeah. How long do you leave the That's balloon up the, for? Uh, I'll leave it up for two minutes at 12 uh, atmospheres. Yeah, so that's the... Um, uh, five millimeter by 100 uh, in the position. Um, and I normally overlap by about 10 millimeters either side. So I use the five millimeter by 80 millimeter Mustang as a vessel prep. 
And now I'm using a 5 by 100 Magic Touch 5, uh, uh, so it's overlap 10 millimeters either side of the lesion. You seem to be a big fan of this non-compliant balloon for your preparation for these vessels. Is your experience pretty yep. good with those, with these uh, diabetic patients and with the high grade amount of ESRF? Yep, uh, absolutely, uh, Chun. Um, for ESRF and diabetic patients, especially in combination with ESRF, we know that the vessels are very, very tough to crack. Uh, usually there's a degree of calcification. So in the distal arteries, um, uh, initially, when I started, uh, you know, uh, I started with uh, semi-compliant balloons and I find anecdotally, it's just my personal experience, there's a lot of recoil. Uh, I find that still, you know, uh, there's some degree of recoil with the uh, non-compliant, but then the recoil, I think, is less. Hmm. Uh, may I ask you, why, why do you have a second wire in place? Oh, yeah, uh, because um, uh, we also um, uh, did the peroneal... Uh, 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 artery as well. Um, so, and for, um, uh, and there was quite a high grade stenosis in the tibial peroneal trunk. Uh, so it's just really <clears throat> to protect the uh, uh, entry into the anterior tibial artery. So sometimes we do that, yeah. Do you think that the dry, the, the, the basic, the jading of the wire may, may, be, may have any impact for the drug delivery to the vessel? Well, I suppose it's an 014 wire. So, only, uh, you know, theoretically, uh, I think the effect, if any, will be uh, minimal. Yeah. Mm. Dr. Chung, this is Dr. Katsang. Oh, but you're here. absolutely right. I, some, sorry? Hi, Dr. Chung. This is Dr. Katsang. I wanted to, I wanted to, do a, to ask you a different question. Uh, regarding the SFA in particular, when it comes to questioning the use of a stent, so for example, if you have a recoil, dissection, whatever, how do you how do you prioritize things? Uh, you know, do you put the stent first and then you do the serolimus coated balloon? Uh, do you do the coated balloon for a few more minutes and then decide on the stent? Because you know, the more complex the disease that you do, the higher the need for stenting. Yeah. Okay. So you are. Um, so we're gonna with uh, deflated balloon. We're pulling out the balloon now. We're gonna put another balloon in. So. Uh, I, I take it your your question is about the treatment algorithm for complex uh, SFA disease. Yeah. When we put in the yeah. stent and at what point do we put in the stent? Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so in terms of my algorithm, um, I generally have a fairly reasonable idea if I'm going to use the stent depending on the complexity of the duplex scans. Uh, but my algorithm is if you go in, uh, you vessel prep, I would put in a drug coated balloon first. Uh, and if the lesions after that look nice, then I would come out. For me, I believe in leaving nothing behind or leaving as little behind as possible. However, after putting a DC, after putting a DCB with a serolimus coated balloon, and I see that there's a lot of uh, there's a significant dissection, type D dissection and above or recoil, then I would uh, consider putting in a, a bare metal stand at that point. Um, the argument then is whether you know you use a drug eluting stand versus a uh, you know a bare metal stand combined with a with a, a drug coated balloon. I mean, there is some evidence out there that drug coated balloon plus a bare metal stand equals a drug eluting stand. So uh, for me, that gives me more flexibility in terms of choosing which bare metal stand I want to use and choosing which drug coated balloon I want to use. Then, if it's a more complex lesion, a lot of uh, uh, five by eight hundred, yeah. Uh, if there's a lot of uh, disease left behind, a very severely calcified vessels, then you will need to, before you apply a drug coated balloon, then I'll have to debulk that lesion first, which means the use of an arthrectomy. After putting an arthrectomy, then I would put in a, a serolimus coated balloon, and if the lesion looks okay after that, then I will stop at that. If there's still a lot of dissection and lesion doesn't look quite nice, if it needs a scaffold, then I will put in a, a bare metal stand. So this is my uh, general algorithm to treatment of uh, femoral popliteal disease. Can I ask Dr. Katsanos a question? And this is almost esoterical. Do you think serolimus is up taken to the vessel wall in very calcified vessels better than paclitaxel? I mean, June, nobody, nobody knows. I have the feeling that uh, all drugs have a great difficulty penetrating fibrotic calcified uh, lower limb arteries. And this is a key difference also with the coronary space. 
And this is why we have so much complexity in the disease and so much difficulty in producing positive results in many randomized studies. Open another one. Open another one. Eddie, why are you doing that? What are your thoughts about putting drug in safari uh, vessels? Because I find that they don't last as long as those that you're wearing in the true lumen and having drugged those. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I think um, it depends. Uh, when you do a safari retrograde and you know you're in the subintimal plane, uh, then I think the biology is very different. Uh, and if you're not in the intraluminal plane, so I find the drug, the osteromus uh, effect on the subintimal plane in general is, 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 you know, it doesn't work as well there. It, so in answer to your question, if during the safari, I find that I can still get into the uh, true lumen and I'm, I, I'm, in, uh, I'm in intraluminal, then I'll probably consider still putting in a sirolimus coated balloon. However, I mean, if I'm using the knuckle to get across the lesion from the bottom, I know I'm in the sub space, then my threshold for using a sirolimus coating balloon is higher. Yeah. You know, you know, June and Dr. Chong, if, my, if, I, may, if I may interfere here, the, the, the reason subintimal uh, angioplasty does, doesn't behave as, as, as good as intraumina is also a lot of mechanical complexity. And, and we have to be honest with ourselves, you know, you cannot expect a drug coated balloon to be able to deal with the recoil of the subintimal space, especially across a very heavy recalcified eccentric plaque. And this is why, you know, subintimal space, we often have to stand that up to 70 or 90% of the time. So I think in terms of algorithm, we have to distinguish between the need for standing because of immediate or early recoil and the need for the drug coated balloon application, which actually biologically makes a lot of sense because you are bypassing the, 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 the barrier, you are bypassing the plaque and the disease. So do you think it's worth putting a short DES at the top or at the bottom of that dissection plane to keep it open? No, I think I think if you need to stand, you need to stand the whole bit. You either stand the whole subintimal space from top to bottom or you don't. Uh, this is my practice and there is some there is some limited evidence to support this. So what I'm saying is it's a different argument whether you need to stand it and it's a different question whether you're going to apply a serolimus coated balloon across the whole Submintimal plane as well. And what do you stent it with? With a bare metal stent or with the DES, uh, Costas? Uh, either, either uh, a pack with axial routing stent might uh, do a great job as well. Well, that's very expensive, you know. You know, there's a lot of stents going down there. Well, you have to remember, it's yeah, but it's usually complex disease in in a CLI case. So CLI cases, you know, the aim is to get the best hemodynamics to save the limb. You know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I would, I would uh, give the best treatment to the patient. But I, I think that uh, we need to stand Constantinos only when we have a, a flow limiting dissection. So we normally go for below the knee. Seventy percent uh, of our cases are subintimal, and we apply drug eluding balloon in all of these cases and uh, maybe we have 1% of stenting. So very long inflation, very good uh, lumen uh, vessel sizing and uh, balloon sizing, long inflations. Uh, at the end, uh, even if you have dissection uh, and uh, it's part of the game, the dissection, you don't have a flow limitation. So you can apply DCB. And the best results I ever had are uh, incredible long lesion that I treated subintimal. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, what I can, I can, uh, my, my view on this, Francesco, and it, it is a very fair argument, actually. I mean, certainly we have many randomized studies supporting a drug eluding stand in Bironi arteries, but only for focal, uh, medium, you know, small, short lesions. And unfortunately, we don't have any consistent randomized evidence to support drug coated balloon application in the long lesions. Now, I know what you mean, uh, but I think it's a little bit early to tell. Uh, still, people are practicing different ways according to their personal experience. Yeah, in the, in the impact BTK, 
the mean lesion length was 22 centimeter, all occluded vessel. And I can tell you that uh, in the majority of these cases, we went uh, subintimal and not intraluminal. And uh, we still have a, a very important uh, reduction in longitudinal late lumen loss. May I suggest that we move on with the next presentation and we have, uh, I think, more time at the end to discuss and uh, summarize our symposium. So. Good afternoon. I'm Alok Finn from CV Path Institute in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about why seralmus coated balloons are a better option for PAD and ABF interventions. Here are my disclosures. So what are the paclitaxel drug coated balloons that have been approved for peripheral artery disease? Here I've listed them all. Uh, they all obviously have paclitaxel and have different uh, excipient coatings. Uh, most of them have received CE mark. These are the ones in the, that have received approval for a treatment of AV fistula stenosis in the United States, the Impact Admiral and the Lutonix balloon. Shown below are the uh, pivotal trials that led to the approval. As you can see, there was significant difference in target lesion primary patency for the Medtronic balloon versus PTA for treatment of AV fistula. Whereas for the Lutonix balloon, didn't quite meet the primary endpoint uh, at six months for uh, patency, but nonetheless was approved and showed an improvement overall in terms of patency. Well, why do we need a Seralmus DCV? We have paclitaxel uh, eluding balloons. What is necessary? Why do we need this? Seralmus is a standard for coronary artery disease treatment via DES and proven to be safe and effective. Paclitaxel modifications, especially turning paclitaxel into a crystalline form, means the coating integrity and transfer are variable with substantial portion lost in the downstream blood and tissues. And this loss of paclitaxel became a central safety concern when the meta-analysis of Katsanos was published in Jaha in 2018, as you all are aware. We've shown in preclinical models that there is significant downstream emboli that occur when you treat porcine femoral arteries uh, in terms of downstream emboli into the skeletal muscle beds. And we've been able to detect paclitaxel in downstream skeletal muscle beds, uh, heightening again the concern for embolization and loss of paclitaxel, as well in the coronary artery scenario, people have shown a decreased uh, coronary flow reserve after paclitaxel eluding balloons when they've been used to treat instant resinosis or de novo, as well as slow flow situations. All of these make paclitaxel less desirable for treatment of vascular disease. Of course, we're all familiar with the meta-analysis of Katsanos, which showed increased risk of death, uh, all-cause mortality, uh, when we compared the paclitaxel coating devices, both balloons and stents, to PTA or bare metal stents, there was significantly increased mortality seen in the meta-analysis of randomized trials, both at two years and between four and five years. And despite the publication of SwedePad, which as you all know, interim analysis showed no effect on safety in terms of mortality at two, a mean of 2.5 years, the FDA said the, the data was uh, comforting, but limited, did not have enough follow-up. So paclitaxel safety concerns still persist, especially with the knowledge that a fair amount of paclitaxel is lost into the body when these balloons are delivered in clinical doses that was shown in data by Kelch, as well as here I've shown you a, uh, uh, a table showing the amount of total loaded dose of paclitaxel on the impact balloon, depending on the size and length of the balloon. So seralmus offers potential benefits over paclitaxel. You can see seralmus may have even better anti-resonotic potency than paclitaxel. It certainly has a wider therapeutic range with a much better safety margin than paclitaxel, although it does have issues with absorption and tissue retention, which limit its efficacy if used alone. So what we really need to do if we're gonna have, make a seralmus coated balloon is enhance tissue absorption and extend tissue retention. Those are the two important aspects that a technology must overcome. The magic touch solution is a seralmus coated balloon where seralmus is delivered in submicron phospholipid particles that transfer the arterial wall. And you can see here on the PK curves in the coronary artery model, I've shown you the levels of seralmus out to 120 days 
showing really detectable levels out to 60 days, which is certainly enough to cause an anti resinonic benefit. So the technology certainly does work. In a preclinical coronary swine ISR model here, we implant a bare metal stent in the Yorkshire pig. We come back at 28 days and we treat that instant restenosis or stenosis that occurs in the bare metal stent with a drug coated balloon or a PTA. And then we harvest the animal at day 56. We look at the coronary arteries as well as uh, downstream tissues and myocardial tissues for evidence of emboli. Here I'm showing you data from that model, showing you the magic touch data, 1x dose, and the POBA, 1x, showing you some evidence of a little bit of fibrin left at 28 days with a magic touch balloon, uh, well healed in both models, no evidence of arterial wall toxicity. And in terms of drug effect, there was significantly more fibrin for the magic touch balloon, showing you successful biological efficacy of drug at 28 days. There was really no effect on stenosis, but that probably wouldn't be ex expected in a low injury model like this. And downstream findings were minimal with almost no evidence of embolized uh, serolimus and no direct e visual evidence of downstream emboli. What about this, uh, the solution, Metalliance solution, serolimus DEB? Those are micro reservoirs made of biodegradable polymers intermixed with serolimus, really a PLGA kind of carrier with a novel cell adherent technology, which is meant to house and protect those micro reservoirs during the balloon insertion, et cetera. This is the data from their model, basically looking at balloon treatment of uh, pig coronary arteries, euthanizing them 30 days later and looking at different groups. We have a excipient coated, non-coated solution 1X and 3X. Here is the data from those different groups showing you evidence or dose dependent evidence of, uh, of biologic effect with increasing uh, fibrin uh, and muscle cell loss as the dose was increased, the 3X dose. Uh, without any change in the uh, injury score. 30 day downstream findings for porcine myocardium really didn't show very much, no ischemic areas, as well as a small number of embolic events, which were not significantly different between groups. So in conclusion, I think I showed you serolimus, the preferred drug for intervascular interventions. Paclitaxel eluted balloons are limited by the high rate of distal embolization and loss of paclitaxel under the body. And these concerns were certainly highlighted by the analysis of Catsano showing an all, increase in all-cause mortality. And still the loss of paclitaxel into the body may be a concern with the treatment of both PAD and AVF or embolization is a potential concern. Magic Touch and Solution SCBs demonstrate successful drug transfer to the arterial wall, and both have received CE mark approval with FDA submission studies ongoing. Their applications are ongoing. Uh, safety uh, studies and preclinical models are ongoing for both balloons. It's important to evaluate the long-term effects on the trail wall where serolimus is no longer present. I haven't shown you those data today. Serolimus coated balloons, I'm sure, will become an important technology for these diseases in the future. So thank you for your attention. Uh, for this uh, very good presentation, I think we go one more time back to the live case to see the final pictures. Can we see your uh, final engrams? Uh, yes, uh, let me just uh, get it. Uh, so from the top, uh, this is from the uh, SF, uh, hang on. Yep, that's a proximal SFA run. We thought there was a bit of a know, type A or type B dissection around the 200 mark. Uh, um, but, uh, we thought uh, this kind of dissection, uh, I, I, I didn't, I, I, I didn't want to stent it. I thought with her uh, potentially we can come back and uh, if, if this was to reach the nose, <coughs> but I, I felt didn't need uh, to uh, intervene uh, any further. Dr. Chok, do you sometimes uh, yep. use ultrasound? Do you sometimes use ultrasound to see if there's a hemodynamic significant dissection or not? Oh yeah, yeah. I have to agree. So yeah. Would you would you consider using ultrasound here because the dissection I think looks not so nice? Uh, yeah, potentially. Um, we have got access to intravascular. Do you mean external ultrasound or? Yeah, external. Uh, intravascular ultrasound. No. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, yeah. Fibus doesn't give you hemodynamic information, only duplex can. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have to say I've, I've not personally uh, used that, um, uh, but I've used uh, sometimes, you know, to guide me, I will use uh, intravascular ultrasound. Uh, but you're right, intravascular ultrasound just gives you, uh, 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 you know, the anatomical uh, without the physiological uh, information. Um, I'm just going to show you, you the below would the knee. Would you stent right that then? Would you stent that? Would you? Would you stent that lesion? I would do an alt duplex, and if I see there's a high grade stenosis, yes, then I would put a stent in. And yes, by high so grade metal. Pardon? Would you do a bare metal, or would you do a DES in that area? Short oh, no, no, no. I wouldn't. I wouldn't use a, a drug looting stent because it has been treated with magic touch, so provisional bare stent. But only, you know, the duplex, we are doing it quite often in the femoral artery, um, uh, you know, when we have uh, dissections, because, you know, you can use a second uh, angioplane, uh, you, you know, you can do, you can do IVUS, and, and uh, the funny thing about IVUS is, if you use IVUS, you will probably likely stand more often, because IVUS, the, the vessel always looks terrible from the inside. Uh, so I, I, yeah. I get I, I guess the duplex, uh, the duplex is a very good uh, way of seeing if there is a, a hemodynamic uh, significant stenosis. Uh, uh, no angio can tell it, no IVOS can tell it, but only duplex. Or you can also measure a pressure gradient. Uh, some people use, uh, 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 see if there's a gradient across that dissection. If there's no gradient, uh, then, then you can leave it alone. Any other comments? Maybe show us uh, how did you get, uh, you know, in the t uh, uh, anterior tibial artery, we had, we had a recoil uh, problem. Did you treat it again or did you? Did, did I, I, you... I, I would just give that uh, I, a GTN. Um, for me, it, it's more of a, a, a physiological recoil rather than a, a mechanical one. So normally with this, I find that if I were to keep ballooning it again and again, it usually then goes into mass basal spasm. So, so with, with most of these, I tend to just give a GTN, and uh, uh, usually they are they are okay. Uh, Can I just ask, experience. with this balloon, when you post, when you got some recoil after the DCB, do you put another DCB in, or do you put back the Pobar balloon? Because theoretically, you can actually push off the drug off the wall. So I tend to, with this, with Sirolimus balloons, put in a half a millimeter bigger balloon, SCB, to line it, to do the pull recall, and actually do it for a longer period of time. And also consider that some recalls are from spasm. When you go back to the angiogram, it looked like a very concentric tapering uh, from both sides. So maybe it is just spasm and not uh, a mechanical recoil. Um, so sometimes I use... Uh, nitro uh, locally to see if I can, if, if the vessel pops up again, then I just leave it alone. We go on to now the uh, final run, which is the foot run now. Um. I think this is quite acceptable. Um, the only thing what I would do is a, is a quick duplex takes you one minute uh, to find out if that SFA lesion uh, uh, is uh, significant. If not, if you know if you have no normal flow velocities inside this dissection, I would uh, I would stop the procedure. And uh, already, I think we all agree that the patient will very likely benefit because uh, uh, the flow is uh, to the foot is much improved uh, compared to baseline. So any, any more comments for Dr. Cho, or uh, if not, we probably can move to the last presentation from Dr. Parikh, please. So Hello, everybody. My name is Sahil Parikh from Columbia University in New York, and it's a delight for me to be here at Link 2021 to talk about unmet needs in lurk surgery intervention with respect to serolimus eluding technologies. These are my disclosures. 
You've already heard in the session from Drs. Katsanas and Finn about paclitaxel and sirolimus and their differences. Um, I think despite those differences, paclitaxel eluting technologies are in the mainstream and they have been so for nearly a decade. And we're going to have to consider what it will take for sirolimus coated balloons and eluting stents to emerge as the dominant force in peripheral vascular intervention in the marketplace. So I think as an interventional cardiologist, we have to go back to the future. And so what that means is if we look back at the coronary uh, wars between paclitaxel stents and Lima stents, what really stimulated the initial concern about paclitaxel, just as in peripheral intervention, was safety. We saw more stent thromboses, we thought, with taxa stents than other stents. And then we realized that there was also a difference in efficacy. Taxa stents were just not as efficacious as the Lima stents, for example, here, the Zions. And over time, now in a large meta-analysis, there it turns out there was no mortality difference between paclitaxel eluting stents and Lima stents. And rather, what we saw was an efficacy difference. And, and that was really what drove the market adoption of Lima stents over taxanes. Um, and so we no longer have paclitaxel eluting stents in the United States, not because of safety, but because of efficacy concerns. So if there's gonna be a change, Maybe the same thing is happening in the peripheral artery intervention space. You saw earlier this fall in the Voyager data, there was no mortality difference between coated balloons and stents and uncoated balloons and stents. Uh, and, and this was followed shortly by the sweet pad analysis, which similarly showed no mortality difference between using drug eluting technologies and non-drug eluting technologies. And again, the only drug eluting technologies in these studies were paclitaxel, coded products. So the safety issue seems to be much less of a concern today than it was a year ago. Uh, and so if you were to sum all the different data, we have really a preponderance of evidence that there's no increased mortality with drug eluting technologies for peripheral interventions. And so now we really need to talk about efficacy. So what's the bar for efficacy that sirolimus devices will have to achieve? Well, um, if you look at all the data, this is uh, from the impact SFA summary data from John Laird. But really now at one year, we expect patency with uh, drug-coated balloons and stents to be approaching 80%. Clinically driven TLR rates at three to five years of at least 70% or greater. And reductions or equivalents in major adverse limb events and mortality. So to me, this is the bar that sirolimus coated products will have to achieve in order to have equivalency or superiority to, to Lymus agents, in addition to the safety measures you've already heard about. So the clinical trial programs from the companies are gonna have to try to strive to achieve this. So let's quickly go through the concept medical clinical trial program. First was the extreme first in man trial. This was conducted in India in four sites uh, and really set the ball rolling. In, in femoral popliteal lesions predominantly uh, we had excellent efficacy and safety with very little in the way of uh, major uh, adverse events and no target lesion revascularization. Next, we have the ecstasy trial from Dr. Choke and his colleagues in Singapore. This was looking at six-month primary patency and safety events in an all-commerce population with a high preponderance of critical limb ischemia. They looked at 50 patients uh, with duplex follow-up and saw primary patencies of almost 80% and 88% in the FEMPOP segment. Uh, this was very favorable to paclitaxel coated balloons and their one year data are being presented at this meeting. Dr. Shok and colleagues have now undertaken the future BTK and SFA trials. These are larger trials that are very uh, uh, fastidiously controlled and are enrolling in a two to one fashion in de novo or restenotic lesions, both above and below the knee. And I think what will be really important is that there'll be core lab adjudicated and followed up all the way out to 24 months. This is the consort diagram for the study, and we look forward to these data in the coming year. These are the endpoints, just for completeness again, and they'll start looking at quality of life endpoints in addition to patency and TLR. Future SFA in the European Union, as well as below the knee will be uh, conducted as well, and these trials will begin in the coming year or two. SIRPAD, which is being run by our, our session chairman, Dr. Kucher in Switzerland, is an important, large, all-comers trial, which will be randomized, looking at uh, all-comers with uh, critical limb and claudication, 
And this will be over a thousand patients with 566 patients per arm. And here's the contour diagram. Patients will be compared to uncoated balloon angioplasty and followed all the way out to two years with a primary efficacy outcome of major adverse limb events, uh, which will, I think, inform us about both efficacy and safety. The most important of the forthcoming trials, I think, is the Serona trial. This is going to be run by Dr. Teichrober and his colleagues in Jena and all of Germany. It's a prospective one-to-one -one randomized multicenter trial stratified by lesion length in 478 patients who have Rutherford's 2 to 4 disease. These patients will be followed for patency at up to two years with a number of safety endpoints and quality of life questionnaires. Um, importantly, these will be patients much like the IDE trials that achieve primary approval for these devices in the United States, and I think will be very important to regulators as well as clinicians globally. Follow-up will be all the way out to 60 months as FDA mandated. And again, this is consistent with the IDE trials that we've seen in the United States. And again, we look forward to seeing these endpoints all the way out to 24 months. Here's the stratification algorithm. Again, we'll see equal numbers of patients with both devices, paclitaxel coded and, and magic touch and in different lesion lengths. Finally, there's a debate BTK trial from Dr. Listro. Uh, this is going to look at head-to-head -head comparison of Magic Touch versus the Lisos uh, uh, paclitaxel coated balloon in below knee intervention. Here's the consort diagram again. Rutherford's four, five, and six will get balloon angioplasty followed by drug-coated balloon at a randomized one-to-one -one fashion with six months angiographic follow-up. And I think this will add to our below-the-knee data. So again, the bar has been set very high for efficacy. Uh, we hope to see from Magic Touch in the coming several years a, a flurry of, of studies and a, a high uh, quality of evidence data that should allow us to move these into the clinics very quickly. Thanks very much. So, Sai, thank you so much for this very impressive presentation on going back to the coronary field and now finally showing the trial program for the uh, LIMUS trials. Uh, uh, what, what I uh, already conclude is that we, we are now starting with big trials, uh, which we have not seen for any of the previous uh, drug looting uh, studies. So the, the old studies were quite small, uh, a few hundred patients only. And now I think we are moving more to, to the more academic field of doing large trials uh, of more than 1,000 patients. And I think this is already good news. And I have two things I would uh, like to discuss in the last two minutes. First, when we compare to the coronary field, we should not forget that it's not only the drug that drives outcomes. There's a polymer on the coronary stand, and the stand, stand platform itself may play a big role for, for uh, outcomes. Is there any comment uh, for that, Sahil, or any anybody else? So the stand platform and the polymer was also uh, considered for stent thrombosis, uh, yeah. not, on, not only the drug. I think that's what we should keep in mind when we discuss about uh, Lemos versus uh, uh, I think, and I think Neil is very quickly, the, the polymer may, may also, or the excipient, it also has to do a lot with the, bio, the, with the pharmacokinetic curve and the expected tissue bioavailability of the device. It's a totally different concept about long lasting polymer routing stand and excipient acute serolimus uh, 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 delivery. Those are two different things. Yeah. And uh, in the coronary, uh, I mean, uh, how do you implant the stents? Because, uh, of course, you have to be really uh, uh, careful about the size of the stents and the vessel. Uh, and uh, if you have uh, a new struts, then the risk of thrombosis is very high. So it's not only the drug, not only the polymer, but uh, it's very important uh, uh, the strategy you're going to implant the stent. And final question before we stop. Should we how should we discuss again TLR or TVR as a as a good primary endpoint for uh, for future trials? Of course, for uh, below the knee, I believe yes. But uh, uh, we 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 think that uh, uh, clinically driven is will be a, a restenosis reocclusion in a patient with uh, 
still a wound open, then you have to give a TLR. You cannot skip the TLR. And uh, also in really symptomatic patients, that's really important because that's the difference. I think the main problem of TLR or TVR as a primary endpoint is, you know, we are using uh, different balloons. We cannot blind. So we, we are doing open trials and I, I'm against using a subjective endpoint, at least an endpoint that involves subjective decision making during the study, uh, uh, you know, for, for um, you know, planning re-interventions and so on, because the, uh, the interventionist has a knowledge what, what was used as in, in, during the index procedure. So there's always bias. And I believe that future trials should not have TLR as a primary endpoint, but have important clinical outcomes, make the studies bigger and look for what counts for the patient. The patient doesn't care about a restenosis. He cares if he can keep his leg and if, if he has uh, maybe uh, new, new procedures for urgent, uh, urgent procedures. I think this is uh, important and also amputations. That's what we should look, care for. That's my, my idea. Any comment? In the setting of CLTI, you do want wound healing as an outcome, but no study will ever do that because the practices of wound healing and wound care is so vast and so different between centers that you would be, that would almost be a confounding factor. But yes, totally agree with you. That, that patient cares about his wound and whether you get full wound healing or not. You know, that's an ultimately functionality. So that should be an endpoint, but no randomized trial or any big randomized trial will ever do that because they are surely going to get a confounding effect. Sure. I think uh, final comment uh, from anybody else. Uh, otherwise, if there's no comment, I thank you very much for this very interesting session. And we all look forward to testing new strategies and PAD interventions. And I wish you a good rest of the link meeting. Thank you so much and have a good day. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.